welcome to the Meta View Podcast. Here, these non fungible conversations, they will yield you great knowledge and perspective. But beware, they might also make your brain go boom. So, watch your step because this rabbit hole goes deep. Good luck and have fun. Welcome, Jordan Hall. How are you doing? Well, I'm maybe in a situation not that different from many people, which is I'm currently quite overwhelmed by the sort of the velocity of, how would you say, change, novelty, information. It's happening this week. You know, somebody mentioned that I was uh, the line between this week and this, that week was is rather astounding. I was in a completely different country. I was focused on a whole set of things. I guess the top stories had to do with the, the trucker convoy in, in Ottawa. And now we're pretty evidently in a different world. Teleporting from world to world so rapidly is uh, is disorienting. How about you? Good, good. Besides <laughs> exactly what you were saying, yeah, the, the world was plunged into chaos seemingly overnight. Although obviously it wasn't overnight, but it came into the, <laughs> the full full-blown overnight yeah i'm excited to have you on you are the the first person from this sort of game b side of things and you're one of the creators of the meme and uh, you want to tell our listeners more about yourself tell our listeners about myself actually no (laughs) i don't have any interest in telling anybody about myself my preference would be to be essentially invisible okay that's good how do you get into this mess without any personal details, I guess. How do I get into, from the past point of view, like how did I find myself here? Uh, yeah, not uh, not specifically on this podcast, but uh, first of all, through like, uh, yeah, this whole uh, Gimby space, the sense making and the project that you're working on right now. Let's see, to make it sort of, take advantage of the present context to see if we can find a way to pull that notion of a personal narrative that is most relevant in the current context. I suppose there's maybe two or three threads. One is, I suppose, happenstance from a very early age, maybe around six, five or six, I found myself pulled along and woven into the, let's call it the, 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 the stream of technology, specifically digital technology. So I have been heavily participating in both directly hands-on and just sort of being part of the milieu that has been driven by the, the sort of the technological acceleration since the late 70s. And this has given me a, a perspective and also some sort of conceptual and experiential tools to sort of perceive the consequences over the in the future of this stream. Right? So this is the uh, exponential technology story and that's just not a story that for me has been the least bit theoretical but is in fact been entirely practical and lived for a very long time you know for essentially the, almost the whole of my life and that's a big piece of the story of what's going on right now whether we like it or not second is maybe hmm. let's go around 2007 2008 where you know, i was sort of in a certain trajectory having built a series of technology companies exited them you know, living the sort of very archetypal life of a reasonably successful West Coast American tech entrepreneur. And my curiosities tend towards the more of the scientific, the historical, and the cultural. So I was exploring those spaces when the global financial crisis kicked off. And that got me pulling on the, on the thread of the sweater, of the meta, the narrative and the social structures that we've been living in curious about what was going on in the financial crisis and then that led me to being curious about what was going on at the geopolitical level and that just sort of led, led me into further and further explorations of uh, curiosity and as i pulled the the sweater unraveled and i found myself perceiving that the the kind of events that we've been witnessing over the past several years you know fill in the blank russia ukraine being the most recent but canada covid trump brexit etc 
were all sort of part of a larger macro story. The kind of the force of history was is bigger, and we could use it to sort of predict what's likely to be coming more or less with broad strokes. And this then, of course, led me into the into the series of conversations that eventually culminated in the thing that I think is now relatively well and well known, although I think not particularly well understood, as Game B, right around 2013, I suppose. And so the, the conceptualization of that, the, the recognition of the consequences of these propositions, the implications of technological acceleration and the the why um, our particular global civilization structure is in a senescent state and heading towards collapse, and what that implies for the future, then leads me to being on this call right now. Right. And uh, you want to give a quick definition of uh, Game B? I also want to ask, like, how do you think this uh, idea of Game B has uh, evolved since uh, you first uh, started talking about it? But let's, uh, let's get a quick intro because I know there are people who aren't even aware of, of it. Well, there's a bunch of pieces to it. There's really not a, the word, the concept or notion of definition isn't actually even the right tool because it's not that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I could invoke a bunch of philosophy to talk about language and words and things like that. But let me just sort of go into it. So we have a couple of different elements. One element is the, is the word game. And the idea of game is to bring into consciousness the recognition remembering in some sense or certainly the awareness that most of the worlds that we humans live in are produced by humans much like ourselves i.e they are not woven into the fabric of reality to which we must simply capitulate uh, but rather were in fact results of choices made by people and therefore are like a game right? they are a set of rules a set of constraints a set of contexts a set of incentive landscapes uh, in which we participate and most importantly that we can choose to change if we reach the capacity to actually make choices as individuals and, and groups so that's the first piece the notion of gain now this doesn't by the way at all imply a lack of seriousness i think anybody who takes the word game to mean non-serious doesn't understand the notion of the word game you know, the, the events that are going on in the context of ukraine are in fact a game that's quite serious but as you can see All of it is the consequence of humans making choices. And the point is that humans can make different choices. And they're playing according to a wide variety of different rules, some of the rules of which are being changed because that's the nature of that game. So that's the first piece. The second piece is very complex, has to do with the notion of uh, duality or bifurcation or phase transition. So the notion of from A to B, which is similar to the notion of from zero to one. Right? The idea that there's a something that we can call game A that has a certain sameness, beingness to it. And that we're pointing to something that is very specifically defined by it's not that. Right? So game B is most notably not game A. Of course, this begs the question of what is game A, and that's a perfectly good question that we can explore if you'd like. But the first point on game B is that it's most importantly, if we can truly grasp the essence of what game A is, then we're pointing to something that is not that essence. It is essentially different. It is fundamentally different. It is meaningfully different. It is actually not just another iteration of the same not say goodbye to the old boss, say hello to the new boss, but is in fact a completely different kind of game. Right? That's the second. Now, there's content. We can speak to that too. What is What are the things that we begin to, to sort of discover or tease out when we explore what it means to say game A? We explore what it means to say, okay, not game A, therefore what is the content of game B? And there's many different approaches. Uh, Schmachtenberger tends to think about it in terms of the compact, necessary, and sufficient conditions for a intrinsically anti-fragile, sustainable human civilization or human social structure. That's a, it's kind of a nice brush. One of the things that I often times point out is the, the recognition of the objective and subjective characteristics of games. So on the one hand, uh, there are objective characteristics of something like say, let's just go with game, game B, meaning there's technical infrastructure, there's institutional forms, there's incentive landscapes that are outside of your particular subjective choices. But there's also subjective characteristics. There's the, the actual mindset that sits between your most sort of fundamental or basic self and the, the world that you're interacting with, that 
shapes and governs your choices from your own interior, entirely separate from the uh, from the objective exterior. So there's psychological, epistemological, aesthetic, ethical uh, characteristics that are part of the the individual mind. And by the way, very notion of what individual and mind mean are part of that content. So to say game A to game B for me is to say a shift in both the objective characteristics of, of what are the contexts that govern the way the human beings participate as individuals in relationship and in relationship with the world, and also the subjective characteristics of those same three things. We can go deeper if you'd like. Obviously, the movement that I'm going in is trying to sort of start at the top, the broadest, most abstract, and then to proceed by sort of concentric circles into characteristics that are more concrete. But obviously, the, the magnitude or the, the amount of stuff gets bigger. There's just a lot more things to talk about, and the details get more detailed. So maybe now's a good time to pause and see what's the best direction to take. What's the best direction to take? Right. I do want to, I do want to dig deeper, but I'm not sure what direction. What do you think? There's many. Um, I would go with your gut. Let's go to the incentive landscape since uh, that's kind of what the, the whole cryptosphere likes to talk a lot about. <laughs> well, okay. So if we do that, then we actually can take it from the point of view first of the cryptosphere. That's yeah, a, a very nice move. The first thing, I would say even the essence of the cryptosphere, so here I'll be specifically talking about Bitcoin, and then we can move broader, is the recognition, like the movement of the idea of money and, in fact, incentive landscapes from this natural, received, not part of human agency world into something that we humans, any of us can just play with. Right? That's the kind of that. That was the huge shift. The uh, the insight, the epiphany of Bitcoin was: oh shit, money is not like gravity. Money is not a god-given thing that just appears out of nowhere. We just sort of live according to it. Maybe a small number of people in a faraway institution have some degree of responsibility for it. It's a protocol that we can choose, and we can actually twiddle with the protocol willy-nilly. We can create all kinds of different protocols, and we can see how they shape individual and collective behavior. So that's, by the way, that's the first insight. I apologize. I sort of did an Aikido move and moved us from the exterior to the interior, but we'll move back out to the exterior in a second. But you get it, right? The, the first move from game A to game B in the context of crypto is precisely the awakening awareness in the subjective of the capacity and the responsibility for choosing the incentive landscapes that we're actually using to govern our behavior as individuals and groups. So then the second is, like, let's talk about this incentive landscapes. I've dubbed or I've endeavored to uh, present the meme of, of alchemy as the, the discipline, perhaps even the guild, the Tao, of the intentional design of incentive landscapes. A different project, very allied, called the Metacurrency Project, yeah, you know, did a lot of great work on this front, gosh, at least a decade, maybe even a decade and a half ago. They called them current Cs, uh, a little bit of a Gen X, a difficult turn of phrase. But the idea is to say, okay, we have humans living in environments that are, are, are very large. The, the number of possible choices we can make outside of our you know, natural context. As soon as human begin, humans begin to do things that are not strictly natural, we expand this, the shape of our, of our choice landscape well beyond our normal cognitive structure. And so we have to work on a simplified map of that structure. And we create boundary conditions. We create enabling constraints and we create disabling constraints. A simple example would be something like um, driving a car. Right? We create stoplights and stop signs and we create speed limits and we create signs. And part of the disabling constraints is we create governance mechanisms, in this case, highway patrols and uh, tickets and removal of your license and things like that. And this creates a whole context of incentive landscapes, enabling and disabling, that radically constrain the choice landscape that we're operating in and therefore make it actually plausible for people to drive, lots of different people to drive and, and largely, probably speaking, get from point A to point B with relative alacrity and relatively limited uh, hazard in comparison to what otherwise could be. Now, Two points on that, by the way. One is that example is a really nice example of how we typically go about doing this sort of thing, which is poorly and from a we might call a bottoms up evolutionary process. Evolutionary process is a term that was developed during the, the deep code phase to describe the the way that systems in general, by the way, i.e. pointing to evolution, it's not strictly human, but 
the moment we'll just use humans, how we solve system design problems by essentially using trial and error. So we just do it. And when something doesn't work, we build something that kind of fixes it. And then we keep doing it. And we sort of keep cobbling together solutions until something more or less works. That's a, a very good example of the basic approach that humans take. And so, you know, um, the automotive transportation system is largely developed according to that protocol, meaning cars would scare horses and run into each other and people would get lost and other you know, people would propose different solutions and some of those solutions would be installed and some of them would work and they'd begin to propagate. And there's like a whole beautiful story about how these things actually evolve into a complicated system of enabling and disabling constraints, information signals, currencies, incentive landscapes. Contrary-wise, sometimes we actually do it uh, intentionally, uh, top-down, uh, from a design perspective. Uh, Bitcoin being, I think, the, the best example of that, right? where uh, Satoshi, asterisk Satoshi, thought hard about what might be a really nice approach, articulated a complete incentive landscape, then instantiated it all at once, and then began the process of watching the game go. And you know, effectively... Most games, certainly most commercial games that you were to purchase, for example, so not baseball or soccer, but say Monopoly or um, uh, Settlements of Catan are designed in that sense. Right? So there's conscious effort to consider in the virtual, in the mental, different parameters that would shape behavior towards the desired direction and then instantiate them as a, uh, a complete system. Although, by the way, generically, Generally speaking, it requires a few bites of the apple before we learn from evolutionary process what we didn't pay attention to. So, incentive landscapes, that's a, a bunch of context, but let's see. So let's take a look at some of the challenges of gaming incentive landscapes. I suppose the, the one that has the most common currency these days, which is nice and broad and covers a lot of territory, is the general problem of Moloch. So this is the... Uh, and the broad statement associated with uh, the reciprocal closing, as John Pavicki would say, or the the various kinds of um, downward spirals or um, local optima exchanged for global optima scenarios that show up when you have uh, certain kinds of incentive landscapes that are strictly called analytic, which is to say that the some number of externalities can actually be thrown into the commons. Um, and are not captured and redirected back to the agents that are choosing them. So game A is, broadly speaking, characterized by that set of Moloch problems, which is, by the way, just a very a different way of saying the same problem as complicated systems. And game B is characterized by those problems being solved or the absence of Moloch problems, at least at the center of what's being designed. And it's got to be a pretty big center, so Moloch problems can only be operating at the at the periphery and are extinguished rapidly before they actually corrupt the, the binding of the center. I imagine right now that may have been a little bit vague or esoteric, depending on your context. So perhaps you might want to ask clarifying questions. Uh, I think most of the people are familiar with Moloch because we talk a lot about Moloch and coordination failure, uh, but maybe like a single sentence explanation. As a, as a meta context, as somebody who maybe listens, remember that I don't have any clue who's listening to this. Like, effectively zero. I mean, I, I barely even know you. Almost not at all. And anybody else who might be listening. And so my ability to predict the context, meaning things like vocabulary and concepts and predispositions and assumptions, is effectively nil. Uh, so if it sounds like I'm saying things that don't make any sense to you, it's because we don't actually have shared context. Many of the people I speak with, you know, all the words that I just said make perfect sense. And the challenge is to try to find a shared language so we can actually begin the process of actually communicating at all. Okay, so a one sentence on the Moloch problem. Well, the easiest one is actually just, uh, I would actually use a, a, a bitly link to Slate Star Codex's uh, essay, because it's, if you don't know it, it's, it's worth your time. But the basic idea is that there's the tragedy of the common style problems or prisoner's dilemma style problems. A variety of problems that are associated with uh, circumstances where the choices of local actors, given local information, deliver results that achieve a local optima, but specifically uh, avoid or pull the system away from a global optima. That would be sort of one way of describing it. 
it may be relevant to the language of thinking that is typical inside crypto space. And the old, uh, what is it, three comma three metaphor is a specifically a, a pointing towards the effort to design systems that don't fall into one comma one Moloch style traps or zero comma zero Moloch, Moloch style traps. Okay, I think that's good enough. For whoever doesn't uh, understand it yet, there will definitely be a link to the Meditation on Moloch, which is kind of a, a mandatory read, I think, for people who get involved in the Web3 space. Canonical text. And I would say that the, 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 piece, the piece that I would add to that, by the way, it shouldn't be perceived as a black pill. It is, it is a canonical text, and it covers a very specific set of things, but it is simply not the case, and I can explain why I believe that's the case, why, why I believe what I'm saying, but it's simply not the case that the Moloch problem is sort of a, uh, oh shit, we're all fucked kind of a story. It's okay. Now we have clarity around a particular kind of problem, and if we're not operating with the right awareness, then we will likely fall into that trap. But it's not woven into the nature of reality. They must always fall into that trap. So if you're reading it for the first time and you feel depressed, accept the fact that you're feeling depressed, but then shake, wake up and get out of it. It's not at the end of the world. It's just a piece of the world that we're trying to navigate. Would you like me to expand on that or would you like to fork to a different topic? Uh, the, on what we're just saying or what we, what we were saying before I asked you like to explain Moloch? Um, you may have to yeah, bridge back to the point that feels like the most the most useful path. Yeah, I'd say bridging back to to that uh -huh. Well, we were talking about the uh, the notion of incentive landscapes. We were talking about the notion that in the context of game B, we take particular attention to the fact that we humans are designing incentive landscapes. So, so then we start to think about, okay, what do design characteristics of an effective game design look like? One of the things that we notice is that the Moloch problem is something that needs to be considered. We actually have to make sure that we're designing our incentive landscapes so that they build towards global optima intrinsically. And in much the same way, for example, that we were concerned about civil attacks when we're designing crypto systems, we also need to be concerned about Moloch attacks when we're designing crypto systems. And by the way, it's, I can kind of go sideways and say, okay, cool, there's other design char characteristics or considerations to be put into the toolbox when you're actually finally at long last looking at, okay, how do we start designing human global systems. I'll give you another one that's actually not, I think, not common knowledge. And I'm going to call this the tainter, the tainter problem, T-A-I-N-T-E-R. So the proposition here is that all human design systems, and I'll use the, the term a complicated system. This is from the a framework called the Kenevan framework, coined by Dave Snowden. Uh, all human design systems, all complicated systems have a finite life span to them. They will inevitably become sclerotic, bloated, inefficient, obsolete, sort of the inverse of their intent, and then, of course, collapse in some finite time. And by the way, that time is large, is best mapped by something like MIPS, not by uh, clock time. It has to do more with the, the number of, of iterations of choice flowing through the system than it has to do with the amount of time the system has simply been in the universe. Much like a metabolic system, right? And your biological system grows old and dies, and it grows old and dies largely based upon the actual number of metabolic processes that it, it pushes through it because there's an entropic uh, characteristic of metabolism that is unavoidable. Same basic idea. You can, it's not perfect mapping, but the analogy is pretty strong. Well, this is interesting. What that means is that there is no such thing as an eternal human made system. So, okay, neat. That means we actually need to be thinking about how we design our complicated systems, for example, our, our crypto systems, with the notion of, of old age and death built in from the beginning. We actually want them to be pre-designed to die. We don't want Bitcoin to be forever. We actually want Bitcoin to grow old. We want Bitcoin to die, ideally elegantly. Here I'd use, by the way, the, the biomimicry metaphor, which is very powerful. I think I've talked about it with Matthew Perkowski. The genotype phenotype uh, distinction is a super powerful concept. The, the genotype in the context of DNA, obviously, is DNA, but the point is actually it's mediated. It's, it's, uh, the information is embodied in a form, nucleotides in a double helix, that is not the same as, quite distinct from the form of that same information when it's instantiated in a phenotype, in a body. So there's uh, no particular similarity between your DNA and, say, your heart or your eyeball. 
and yet they're both instantiations of the same fundamental code, the same fundamental information. This is very powerful because when you die, what dies is your body. Right? Your body grows old and dies, but your your DNA is conserved. Right? So in some sense, the certain codons that you have in your DNA have been around for billions of years. So this gives rise to what I think is the appropriate metaphor. So a crypto system that is properly designed would be able to take advantage of the difference between something that would be happening at the generator function level, at the DNA level, at the genotype level, which would then instantiate something at a particular kind of incentive landscape at the phenotype level governed by the generator function but would be aware of would be designed from the very beginning to actually grow old and die and return energy back to the generator function which could then instantiate will effectively be the child of that um, of that crypto system so if we're thinking about how do we actually begin to design consciously from the top down informed by the bottom up in game B, that's another tool. So it's okay, gosh, we've got now at least three. One is the the, the fact, the awareness that we're in, in fact looking to design incentive landscapes. That's a thing we can do, in fact must do. Uh, two is we need to avoid things like Moloch problems. Uh, three is we actually need to avoid things like Tantra problems. And that implies taking advantage of concepts of uh, genotype, phenotype, and life death, birth death cycles. Yeah, I like the idea of designing it so that it graciously dies rather than collapsing you'll notice by the way that if you think about the crypto ecology as a whole ecology as i say you know bitcoin ethereum DeFi, like the whole space think of it as a whole ecology as an object there's just there's one there's one ecology it contains many different subspecies that have a lineage earth death cycles happen all the time right? so we've, we've named these winter and spring and then summer and fall but winter and spring being the most notable and winter of course is the time of death and in the context of crypto winter particularly the more painful one lots of stuff died and that's good because that actually winnows away things that were potentially useless or distracting and not strong enough to endure freeze resource usually in this case human energy and attention and even mental like psychological resource to expand back out into it in, in sort of a diffuse fashion and then allows that resource to be driven by the more fundamental characteristics the generator functions oftentimes unconscious uh, to manifest what would actually be coming in the next birth phase and so the ico phase you know, just imagine if we lived in this horrible hypertrophied never-ending ico uh, eternal summer where everybody was still more or less operating Being horrible yeah, exactly or or the you know the altcoin phase like you know there's the if we, all we had was just an an infinite regress of different variations on litecoin and dogecoin everybody exploring that landscape and kind of eth had never happened it would be horrible right it would, would not just be horrible it just have been it would have died early but that's not how it works what happens is that there's an exploration phase the s curve hits the middle everything is very interesting we've kind of exploring the fact that oh it's not just bitcoin it's actually blockchain and incentive landscapes and protocol design let's play with a whole bunch of different protocol designs and then there's a an ending of that energy the s curve tops it, it becomes to add, begins to asymptote and then there's a return of energy and attention and creativity and resource back to the to the abstract to the purely virtual and there is a innovation a move into a new possibility in this case uh, what would happen if we actually did this use this blockchain thing as a kind of programmable uh, world computer hmm. new completely different idea we're not just doing money we're doing something different it's actually a different concept and there's a if you think about it from the point of view of ecology or evolution this is effectively a, a speciation event or at least even maybe a genera event and a branch occurs and a whole new piece of the landscape now is explored on this new possibility and of course that expands and explodes and it falls its own s-curve and it winnows and dies and there's a nice winter and then there's another s-curve that emerges right so that's a, a nice evolutionary example of the same idea it's it's built in it's the right way to do things okay great if you're now if you're thinking about that from the top down you should design those kinds of things into your systems from the get-go uh, to take advantage of that natural dynamic of how reality properly operates can i go a little further on that yes please in the context of the tainter dynamic uh, one of the things that shows up as complicated systems mature and become senescent is they become extremely parasitized and the parasites generally show up as sort of two kinds. One kind is the parasites on the interior, 
we may call these control structures or bureaucrats. And the second is parasites on the exterior, which are the things that are entirely just stealing energy from the system. They have nothing to do with the interior of the system. So to move from the abstract to the concrete, if I'm sitting in, in Western civilization in 2022, something like the leadership of the financial and political, and to some extent, economic elite of the West, United States, Canada, Western Europe, are parasites of the first kind meaning that they have successfully learned how to game the complicated system that came out of World War II, broadly speaking, and have managed to uh, extract as much of the value as they, uh, as is in some sense plausible from that system and appropriating that from the whole, now I'm kind of flagging a bit of a Moloch problem, to themselves. Right? So this is a gangsterization of any system so it begins not gangsterized over time the interior becomes increasingly gangsterized and it becomes effectively impossible to tell the difference between a of course call it legitimately or or formally elected politician and uh, just a straight up thief and of course this is a misappropriation of the vital energy of the whole system a moloch problem and it points the energy towards local optima the benefits of the individuals who happen to be effective parasites and away from the well-being of the whole, which is why it's a tainter problem, which leads to the collapse of the whole in a finite time. The other side, of course, is uh, parasites from the exterior. And of course, in crypto, we're extremely familiar with those kinds of folks. These are the, you know, the, the degens and the rug pools of the universe that aren't on the interior of anything, but they're generating simulations that are difficult for most people to distinguish from real vital pieces of the ec ecology and so they pull energy away but because they're optimizing for pure extraction their ability to actually hijack the, the perceptual apparatus of choice makers is very high um, it's easier to pretend to be something than to actually be something this is the uh, super salience problem junk food you know it's very difficult for a human to actually choose nutritious food because our perceptual apparatus, which is an evolved thing, right? we're evolved animals in a natural environment, it's actually not that hard for food scientists, which is more like food uh, parasites, to simulate things, create things that look really, really healthy, they taste good, they smell good, they may even have awesome textures, but they're nothing but simulation. Um, and so your average person is fooled and gives their, their energy, in this case, their money and their nutrition, their, their, their food they're choosing to eat, to these parasites, and instead of giving it to nutrition. All right? So that's a parasite from the outside. Uh, and of course, crypto is uh, oftentimes characterized by both, less so by the former, because the, the winter cycles tend to winter things away, but it's still plenty, obviously. Something like consensus has done plenty to funnel energy to itself, not towards the well-being of the whole. But these two dynamics, right, the parasites from the inside and the outside, are things that are part of that aforementioned tainter curve and categorically how do i say this at principled level fundamentally the only way to actually extinguish parasites at the end of the day is actually to go through birth death cycles any complicated system will eventually become parasitized in one or both of the two directions and so you actually have to kill it and have it be reborn from the uh from the transcendent or from the generator function how do you know the time has come uh, how do i or how does one yeah how does one mm. That's a very nice question. Before I wanted to ask this, I want to say how this kind of segues us into the question of sense making and how it like uh, nice makes going forward possible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go through this. Mm. So this is a profound question. I would mention, by the way, that let me just give you kind of an example of an architecture. Broadly speaking, you want to design these kinds of things well in advance of the time coming because as you get closer to the time coming the thing that is making choices which is to say the complicated governance system is actually getting dumber and that's trouble and if, if you're like like right now <laughs> in politics you know the, the problem is actually that our our democratic our governance institutions are incapable of actually governing and so of course they can't actually resolve the problem of their own incapacity to govern you don't want to get there. So if you're there, you're in deep trouble. So that's one thing. Uh, and we can go off on that. That's actually a very useful place to go, but let's pause there. What you want to do, again, is sort of design things from the get-go so that they 
it's actually harder and harder for them to live. You want the, the, the cost of continuing to be to actually be on some kind of accelerating dynamic. So while the design I'm about to give isn't, I don't think, a very good design, at least points in, in the right direction. Uh, so imagine if you had a, uh, let's say you had a proof of stake kind of governance mechanism, a system that I'm not particularly endorsing, but it's people understand them. But part of the built-in system was that the the clock had a, a certain number of times the clock went. Let's, I'll just use the time as a, a normalizing factor. So let's say um, after three years, there was a, a mandatory 51% vote of stakeholders that had to occur. Otherwise, uh, the blockchain would self-destruct. After three more years, the vote had to be 66%. After three more years, the vote had to be 75%. And after three more years, it was inevitably going to die. Right? So this is actually hard wiring in at the level of smart contracts and escalating burden of affirmative choice for the thing to continue to exist. And that's kind of a concrete orientation towards what this kind of a design protocol would look like. And by the way, at the end, it's terminal. It for sure dies in a finite, in a very particular finite time. And I'm choosing those, those years with some sense of how long things will last at the current bandwidth, even that's problematical. All right, so how do you know? One thing that you notice is the orientation of attention towards optimization and away from fundamental innovation. I, I used to call this thing the Rococo, if you're familiar with that from, from architecture. There's an insight in this case of architecture, Gothic architecture, which has certain characteristics. And there's a point at which the system is no longer really innovating. It's just adding flourishes. So we can look at what happened in DeFi, for example, where there was a an insight around staking and around the ability to actually generate return on staking. And there was a, a period where when you witness it, you notice that there's actually a vitality to it. There's a, a bunch of innovations that are happening around that insight. But then you begin to notice, and this is again, that sort of the S curve, that new things that are coming out are variations on the theme as opposed to actually new ideas. I'm sure there's actually a formal way to, to actually look at the amount of, of uh, adjacent possible that's being explored, but I don't know how to do that myself. Then you'll begin to notice more and more two things. One is a rising cynicism in the environment, you'll actually notice that the general narrative is actually becoming more cynical. And this is actually a healthy recognition of the re of a reality. And of course, you'll notice an increasing rise in um, various forms of uh, scam. Uh, rug pulls is a you know contemporary variation on the theme, but you can fill in the blank. My point is that actually the people who are involved in the earliest stages are the ones who are the most well positioned to notice because they actually are connected to the source generator function, the, the thing that gave rise. And so when they begin to look around and notice that the, the narrative, uh, the group, the community, is decreasingly characterized by people who are connected to that source and increasingly characterized by people who, even at just a pure gut level, feel off. <laughs> it's not hard. Like if you go to a, I remember going to er early conferences. I went to one in Los Angeles. God, who knows how long ago? Well, but before the ICO, so it must have been 2014, 2015. And it was just shitheads everywhere. It's not hard. Like shitheads are shitheads. It's easy to know. Your system will just tell you, that guy's a shithead. Oh, this conference is all shitheads. Okay, we're nearing the end of this cycle. I guess maybe just put it that way. I like guess it's, it's kind of simple. If it's shitheads everywhere, you're near the end of the cycle. If the people who are, who are sort of in the center of the conversation are actually interesting and the conversations are clearly novel. And that's, I mean, I'm moving my hand, but the point is it's actually not that unclear. Your system knows. Like human beings evolved over very long periods of time to distinguish between con artists and real. Um, so the first thing we do is listen to your own system. If your system is giving the flag, hmm, feels like it might be a con artist. Okay, probably is. Great. Now, when you start to notice that it starts to look like con artists in every direction, or maybe if you notice your own system that you're becoming cynical, the point is actually not to get black pill. This is, the, I think, the risk is that people get cynical, and what they do is they sort of paint a broad brush, like, oh, this whole thing is bullshit, or it was, has always been nothing but, like some really broad brush. 
the point is to recognize is that you're actually at the end of a particular life death cycle and that the appropriate response is to actually take a step all the way out, go back into a diffuse awareness and back up from the entire system and take a look. Say, oh, oh yeah, oh, here we are again. In some sense, great, awesome. That means the clock is ticking. Death will occur soon. And the appropriate response is to actually, in my own psychology, my own mind, allow myself to get out of the concentrated awareness that's so crucial during the mad rush of a new territory and relax back into the, to the diffuse awareness, which is the place from which innovation and perception of novelty comes. By the way, you can look at John Verveke's work in cognitive science to look at exactly how that works at the level of individual humans. And we're doing a lot of work right now to figure out how to, to replicate these same kind of movements between focused awareness and diffuse awareness at the level of distributed cognition. So you know, notice, is the conversation like manic? is the proliferation of novel finer and finer distinctions are being made like the mimetic structure cultural distinctions are beginning to get very very fine grained and we're making smaller and smaller distinctions that's it's actually useful we need to do that that's called creating a vernacular um, to understand and create pointers and details around the territory but it also is telling you that you're entering the end stage of that particular domain and so and then you have to build habits you have to actually just build a certain skillfulness of noticing where you are like oh yeah, everybody's you know it feels like a small club of people who are all kind of speaking drinking the same kool-aid and talking about the same shit and the memes are getting dense all right we're probably reaching the end of something as opposed to that feeling of spaciousness when you've entered into the beginning of it and the memes are very far apart and large pieces of you can almost like feel or see large pieces of territory associated with every particular uh, mimetic construct. Right. I like how well uh, this applies to both like the DeFi way as well as like the US Senate. <laughs> Shitheads everywhere. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, it's, it's mechanism invariant. It's a fundamental in the nature of the relationship between information and energy. Where do we want to go next? Well, by we, you mean you and I. I'm going to let you make that choice. If by we, you mean the human species, we've already named it, but we can go into more detail on that. Yeah, yeah, let's do. No, the old system has got to die. Got bad news for you guys. We just identified the fact this is a mechanism invariant characteristic that is fundamental to the nature between relationship, energy and information. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We build complicated systems that humans do. Complicated systems get old and then they die. Now, they can be particularly effective at not dying. They can be zombies for a long fucking time. The longer they're zombies, the worse the consequences when they die. Dying early and easily and honorably and gloriously is good. Uh, hanging on to life well past your natural date and dragging everything else down with you, that's bad. In fact, I would even make that distinction good and evil. That's the essence of evil is precisely that. We're holding, we're hanging right now in the middle of a very dead, very zombified, very ineffective and evil old system. It's got to die. Unfortunately, it is in fact mostly parasite and its tendrils are plugged into almost everything. It's like trying to get a very uh, mature glioblastoma out of a brain. Not easy. And uh, the poison and, and the cure are very difficult to distinguish. So the amount of energy or effort necessary to finally at long last extinguish the old system, unfortunately, might also, well, might, will uh, jeopardize the whole thing. And that's just where we are. So it's going to be painful. All right, fine. Let's just recognize that's just reality and accept it. So that's the first step. The old system's got to die, and it's going to be tricky. It's going to be painful. It's going to be scary, and it might not work. That make it. Fair enough. This is the whole point, game A, game B. So if we're going to do that, if we're going to make that level of a risk investment, we should at least be very thoughtful about what it is we're doing. We certainly don't want to go out and like open up the brain, carve out some, some uh, tumor, but not actually be thinking about how to go after the whole tumor. That'd be a very bad idea. We need to be thoughtful. What is it we're trying to get rid of? AMA. That's the name. That's the name of the thing we're trying to get rid of. Just replacing one version of game A with another version of game A, which we sort of consistently do, is not a good idea at this point. Right? The whole of game A is a meta S curve. Right? So each particular instantiation of game A, like let's say uh, second industrial revolution capitalism, or for that matter, medieval feudalism, has its own S-curves, right? it's, it's an S-curve made up of S-curves, by the way, there's a whole fractal density here, 
But all of game A is actually a giant meta S curve. And the proposition I've made is that, that we're reaching the end of that, which is a big deal. It's not the same thing as reaching the end of any subsidiary S curve. We're actually reaching the end of that entire arc, the inexorably self-terminating language, and by the way, soon. So we're reaching the end of a big arc. It makes the moment that we're living in all the more particular. So the first move is to say, okay, we're going to have to quite consciously, quite seriously, quite intentionally, quite carefully uh, excise this tumor that has been sitting inside the human system for a very long time and recognize the objective and the subjective. So this involves not only upending and redesigning every single human institutional structure from the ground up all the way back possibly over thousands of years, but also doing the same thing in the interior. You know, recognize that everything down to fucking grammar is potentially implicated in the the infrastructure of game A, and it's got to go. Now, we may not be able to do any of this in a generation or even several, so we also need to be thinking about the ameliorative process. How do we actually sort of hospice game A appropriately while building out increasing capacity to actually navigate the transition? It's not going to be a thing that gets done in a weekend. And the metaphor of the new thing is birth. Remember, death and birth, these are very good metaphors. Right, the thing, the new thing is being born, and being born is a very powerful concept. Do you have kids? Nope. Having kids is super useful, and by the way, mandatory if you'd like the species to continue. Birth is a developmental process over which the parents have very limited responsibility. So, you, you conception, which rarely is deeply, deeply in particular, right? it's very biological, and then every stage of embryonic development is happening at the level of the embryo, and the parents are largely playing the role of context. Right? So the, the mother is providing a, a womb, which again is entirely bio biological, and is making choices around things like her emotional state and her nutrition and the kind of risks that she's putting the, the embryo to. All the work is actually being done by the embryo. And the father is even further removed, nonetheless important in creating context. And by the way, the family and the community, right? So that's a very powerful metaphor. When we're talking about game B, we're actually talking about that kind of a relationship. Something is being born. It's mostly doing most of the work. We happen to be human as, as individuals. We have to be part of it. And we also happen to be part of the kind of the parents of it. And we're playing both roles. So part of it is discovering in ourselves what's actually emerging with curiosity. Like we're not making it happen. It's happening and we're noticing it, participating in it and learning it from scratch in the same way that a child learns how to see or grab a pee or, or or to stand up and walk and talk right so the emergence of game b is the emergence of that kind of thing and we're part of it so we're learning it from the inside and most of it's well outside our capacity to perceive or understand we just need to become more and more capable of actually embodying it and at the same time we're also parenting it and so we're needing to learn how to play the role of steward in context and providing a uh, a safe venue for the, uh, the evolutionary development of this novel thing. This is a very different mindset, right? The game A mindset, you know, the engineering mindset, for example, the thing that builds bridges, doesn't operate in that fashion. Um, this is much more in the in the fashion of, say, a grandmother gardening. And I don't mean even gardening in the British sense. I mean gardening almost in the indigenous sense, like co-cultivating with nature in a fashion that is very much guided by nature's own, let's say, intent or design than it is driven by a particular human developed ideological framework speaking of which and i have to move to my next call <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> no worries no worries i feel like we didn't get to wrap up and talk about cevium but uh, i guess we'll have to do that at another time the world is big it's a lot of stories thank you <laughs> thank you thank you for coming on here you're welcome this was great i hope that it was uh useful i think it was All right, well, adios. See ya.